Hello, I'm Bob Gorley, the Chief Technology Officer of UDA LLC. This recording captures content from our 18 October 2022 UDACon. UDACon was an event designed to bring together people from our community to talk about this age of exponential innovation and disruption so we can all learn how to better survive and thrive. The topic of this panel, we called it Open the Pod Bay Door. Resetting the clock on artificial intelligence. Why? So frequently, artificial intelligence has been like a big head fake. We look towards AI and we're told about AI, but the ball gets past machine learning again and again and again and again. But some new developments are coming. Developments like large language models, like GPT. Who better to address this topic of resetting the clock on artificial intelligence than Lewis Shepard? a senior executive with government and industry experience who closely tracks artificial intelligence. He was joined on a panel by Mike Caps, the CEO of Diveplane and the former president at Epic Games, and Sean Gorley, the CEO and founder of the artificial intelligence-based company Primer.ai. The theme of this day is about exponential change we would be asking, I would be asking you on that scale, okay, so looking ahead six months, what would be the technological change that would most surprise you? But, um, but let's be audacious here and be ambitious. Uh, given that, uh, I think, very true statement, change has never happened this fast before, it will never be this slow again, what do you expect in the way of surprising, novel, technological uh, changes, uh, novel but anticipatable, oh, that's, that's, a, that's a terrible <laughs> word, uh, which we can anticipate um, in the next five years. Let's not uh, uh, be shy here. So we will start at the far end of the table. Yes. Shy. I'll, I'll go. Um, <clears throat> I, I think I think for me it's going to be um, uh, swarm dynamics. I think um, you know th these can be sort of coordination of, of groups of objects. They can be machines. They can be people. Um, they can be financial markets. But I would say you know swarm dynamics. I think is going to just like rapidly move. And I think the capabilities of swarms and our ability to kind of control um, and deploy them. I think is going to be um, just you know, step change better. I think on the other side of that, our ability to kind of crash these systems, um, I think is also going to be, um, you know, something that we're going to learn how to do as well. So both both the kind of the value of these systems and the ability to kind of crash them. Um, swarm dynamics, um, I, I, I think we're going to see swarms just, just doing things that individual, um, you know, machines just can't do. Oh, wow, shouldn't have done that. Um, Golly, uh, really hard question. And I would say that what we've seen in the past, say, five or six years with that ever increasing um, uh, sort of exponential cycle of technological innovation, it's hitting its limits in our ability to socialize those changes. Um, and, you know, I think that everything that's going on with stable diffusion, Dolly's great example of the percentage of people who don't know what it is and haven't heard of it yet, the people who are worrying about it from a copyright perspective and how do we implement this in our business to the ones whose entire business is founded upon it. Um, we're separating the technological haves from not haves quite a bit. And if you look at sort of the dynamics of the U.S. defense apparatus, my apologize, uh, apologies in advance to those of you who work at Primes, um, but it's absolute destructive crap for a high-paced technological innovation cycle. And like it or not, when the you know PLA fields a thousand boats and they're all using off-the-shelf televisions that are going to be tossed out and replaced and they cost a hundred bucks, there's something to be said for that, which is rapid innovation. Um, but I think it will just keep driving us towards rapid innovation happening in smaller and smaller circles. Um, somebody was talking about cloud at large companies and it's kind of this joke where there's none of the actual data is sitting in the cloud and cloud's been around for anybody know a decade something like that functionally actually everyone was using it for six years but ask american express what of their data is on the cloud and it might be some of their hiring info or um, their party invites but it's nothing that's important to them because they can't absorb it fast enough in a risk averse way and so that giant leap from the small innovation studio which of course everything's on cloud and they're 
innovating so quickly because they just grab Kubernetes and go, 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 is going to have that same disruptive influence that you're talking about, I think, with government, which is if government can't possibly even keep up with the idea of what it is. There's not even a notion of can we regulate AI at the government says We don't even understand what we're supposed to be regulating and the cycles are too slow and the large companies can't do it, then where does the power go? It's going to shift entirely. Uh, it's going to shift to quick, small, fast innovators who can, I hate to say it, break things uh, and not care about all those regulations that nobody understands anyway. Because the real forefront is at places like stability. That's where, you know, I'm going to keep plugging, by the way, your company. That's what's going on right now. That is the world as we know it. Even OpenAI is getting disrupted by AI technology they've helped develop. So I have no idea what that looks like, but it is very much power to the people in a, in a whole new way. That's fascinating. Okay, both of you, very good uh, answers. Um, half marks each. Because um, we have a lot more uh, to cover on this topic yet. If only you'd given us the questions in advance, sir. No. Um, <laughs> the, the, uh, so, Mike, I'm coming right back at you. I, I'm, <clears throat> if I take it face value, your answer, um, one might um, presume, hey, this is fantastic news for the United States and the Western innovation ecosystem because we um, have a tradition and culture, um, much of which we've heard about today, of um, optimizing for small groups and independent groups. And we just heard about the many exciting billions of dollars uh, AFF and others uh, are um, devoting to innovation in the startup system. And I don't know of a comparable small circle optimizing, small groups of people independently minded and competitively driven um, uh, in the other major innovation ecosystem in China. So therefore I would be hyper optimistic about if, if that's the case. But you mentioned OpenAI, so uh, another guy we all know, Jack Clark, has uh, he wrote earlier this year, um, you know, we've been thinking that uh, AI really comes down to two resources, data and compute. And it's turning out that compute is just data in fancy clothes. I think that's his quote. Um, <clears throat> and he has been, he and others have been writing um, for the last couple of years about uh, the phenomenon of nation state scale activities and investments by uh, the largest tech companies in AI, in R&D for AI, and that the mega platforms in the hyperscalers uh, can't be matched by uh, others. Now, there are, a lot of, there are a lot of phenomenal activities and innovation that go on around them and on their platforms, but in terms of providing the technological kind of foundational and frontier advances to steal from, um, AFF, the foundational and frontier advances, uh, there is a school of thought that, no, it's, it's all going to be locked up uh, increasingly by these very, very large multi-billion dollar, near trillion dollar eventually investments in mega platforms. So, uh, it is, and certainly that's the Chinese premise right now. So, how would you weigh that as an alternate roadmap to what you sketched out? Uh, gosh, okay, so I would say that yes, for certain applications of AI, having a million dollars you can throw at compute and write a paper is useful, but I think it's a subset of what's interesting in that space. I think um, a great example is in North Carolina, it's against the law to sell eggs unless you have a $300,000 candling device. And uh, that was a law designed by companies who had them to stop local farmers from being able to sell eggs to their neighbors. Um, that's part of the problem that we have here. This regulatory environment is part of the primordial soup that you need. It's not just data and commute, compute. You need a regulatory environment that allows innovation. And you know, arguably, we do not have that. That's why we're not getting lots of fatalities on the roads with really bad level five 
driving cars, but it's also why we're not fielding lots of level five cars, right? It's, it's a tech problem, but also a regulatory problem. And I would say that yes, the US, if, if you're thinking that you're gonna walk away from any panel today feeling great about yourself, you're wrong. And when you say yes, the US is built for small group innovation and we have the system to do it, I would say that I would say Eastern Europe or um, Scandinavian countries are just as strong in that space, plus scrappier, plus perfectly willing to skip the rules. Uh, so that kind of lends itself more to it. Plus they don't have the same, well, I could just work at Meta for 350K right out of school because I have a master's degree from Stanford in AI. Should I really take this risk? Well, only if DCBC gives us $10 million to try it. So I'm not really taking a risk. And that entire system doesn't exist either in a country that doesn't have those options or one that has a fantastic social net like Finland where you can take that risk and it's a safe risk to take whereas we don't take it so I, I would argue that maybe we're not the best place for that in the that's an excellent response in the uh, tradition yeah. of, of uh, annoying moderators uh, pressing the panelists uh, I'm now going to go back uh, on Sean's uh, prediction of swarm dynamics um, this morning we had uh, great among the great discussions John Robb uh, sketching out, I think, fully accurately, um, in, in startling detail, uh, the emergence of the, I forget the phrase, but the disparately uh, uh, developed uh, swarm that is opposing Russia, growing out of open source and um, uh, powerfully enabling uh, Ukrainian military advances. Uh, he, he said, John's still in the room, he, he uh, made the little uh, kind of sidebar comment towards the end. Well, we were already seeing fractures in that. Um, is that what? What's the complexity of the two-year, three-year, five-year development of uh, this notion of swarm dynamics? It's 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 both a technological concept, but it's also this kind of sociological. Uh, cultural aspect of the development of the technology itself. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> in the West, we, we've, we've done a very good job of sort of reductionism, understanding the components. Um, and um, and then you put component A and B together and you get A plus B. You know, 2 plus 2 equals 4. I think in the swarm dynamics, 2 plus 2 equals 5 oftentimes, and we don't really understand why 2 and 2 equals 5. Um, there is actually a fairly strong um, body of research sort of branching out of physics that, that starts to examine dynamics of swarms um, and it kind of runs everything from stock markets to opinion formation to kind of actually mechanical um, dynamics of swarms. Um, I wouldn't, look, if, if you were running this and you had the capacity, like first things is we're in an information war today. It is the first AI driven conflict that we're in. The information battlefield is opinion formation. And the benefits of that are, are, are much more than we, we kind of think and understand. If we take the dynamics with Ukraine and say, well, look, if there wasn't a kind of a narrative that said, come back and fight, this is something you can actually, you know, potentially achieve and it's something you should do. There is no war, right? The war's over. The thing that we misunderstood um, was the dynamics and the importance of opinion formation and the narrative battlefield that actually unfolded the the, the sunflowers and you know seeds in your pocket, the Snake Island, and the ghost of Kiev, right? Like these are the dynamics that allowed that formation of of, 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 of mobilization of a force to come together. I think if we don't take the lessons that we're in an information war and we don't treat it as such, then we're, we're going to lose. The second bit is it is an AI generated and mediated war and increasingly it becomes an AI generated war as we can start to generate all of these dynamics that feed into it. The final piece underneath that is that there are ways to control, fracture, um, coalesce, you know, break apart these systems. The research is there, you know, which, which we've got to assume that, you know, that any kind of sufficiently advanced country is starting to look at this and say, how do we leverage this to our benefit? China being one of those things, they've got a much more sophisticated information defense environment than we do by proxy of being a, um, an authoritarian state versus a, you know, a liberal democracy. So we were in an asymmetric conflict to start with. Um, but the first war that's going to happen is going to be, you know, convincing the world that Taiwan is part of China. Right, and that is the war we're in today, and we don't even know that we're in it, yet alone have any kind of defense or ISR capabilities around it. So that has to change, has to change quick. So let's, uh, I, I want to uh, get into um, 
a little, eventually in a moment, a little more practical discussion based on the two companies that you're each leading because uh, you're doing exciting things in uh, artificial intelligence, um, the, the, each of which are non-traditional uh, in what we think of as this you know, last few years of traditional AI ML stuff. Uh, however, on that, on that point, information, uh, opinion formation as an element of the, the information warfare battlefront. Um, something I've been really fascinated by is our um, lack of exploration of the opportunities available in, um, just to be really simple, in pushing truth. So it seems to me that if we were to develop a really hyper-aggressive um, uh, approach to uh, using many of these same tools, technologies, uh, and others, and particularly leveraging the uh, massive advantage that open information economies have on opinion formation and um, uh, handling misinformation, uh, that if we took a more aggressive approach, we could essentially begin to develop uh, uh, truth into what I suspect it has been over centuries. Um, and this is because I'm a, you know, a, a passionate uh, advocate of the Enlightenment. It's a superiority engine. Yeah. Look, we, we before we even get down that line, we've outsourced our information diet, our information feed for the the a large proportion of the sort of the the fifteen to you know forty year olds to China. They run TikTok. I mean, like. You don't think any sort of conflict that unfolds all of a sudden, the algorithm starts biasing things in different ways. We have given our entire information ecosystem to China. Or, or I'd I mean, say it, to capitalist organizations, no, which also don't have no, truth it, in mind. It's right? China. I mean, China is running TikTok. Oh, and totally agree. Like, I'm just saying we, Google, we have, Twitter. Not. But we have, we have a, a tremendous um, deficit or, or kind of vulnerability. If we ever go into any kind of conflict, China owns our information diet of a large proportion of the population here with a lot of sophistication. So the first thing we have to do on that is get away from that, which means either banning or nationalizing TikTok like quickly. Like we can't um, do that any more than China would let us run its information ecosystem in its country. I mean, it's absurd. Mike? Yeah, I completely agree. That's It's a horrifying problem. And uh, unfortunately, the notion of let's push truth change that. Um, let's push, push truth is a really, really hard problem. I mean, just watch the COVID vaccine signs that we're putting up. And what's the budget that we've assigned on a state and national level for that? And how poorly is that going? I apologize. I'm a very poppy speaker. Uh, so, and, and truth doesn't sell. It doesn't sell on TikTok, but it also doesn't sell on YouTube, right? Edge theories are more interesting and negative news shares more quickly in a social, a heck, in a human space. And so the idea of pushing truth is a really hard problem, especially when you have, say, 80% uh, of Republicans have said they don't trust our electoral process. I don't disrespect or respect that in any way, just like that's the number nationwide. So who's got the truth? It's not CNN, right? Because they don't trust them either. I, I, I don't know how to solve that problem because it's so easy to erode trust and it's so hard to rebuild it. Uh, you know, like it or not, before there was an ambulance at Parkland, there were Twitter accounts going crazy for gun control and Twitter accounts going crazy for stopping gun control from Russia right that second because it's AI driven. They're able to handle that problem more quickly than humans can go try to win hearts and minds on the issue. I, I don't know how you beat weaponized AI for attention in either a capital market where you know, YouTube wins by showing you stuff and getting you to stay all day and that's not the same as showing you the news. And TikTok wins by creating a weaponizable you platform. You can't you can't conflate YouTube and TikTok. I mean, it's just like totally am. It's one 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 is 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 owned by your opponent, and the other is is got capitalistic um, you know money generating things. That the motivations are, are very very different across both of them. I uh, completely agree. And then I would so scale absolutely TikTok have to stop it. I'm with you there. YouTube not good and also manipulable by anyone with money. Um, and so that's an additional problem, right? The Facebook Cambridge Analytica problem is not because Facebook folks are evil. They are not at all. It's that it's an easily manipulable system to access people's minds and move them for 0.14 cents or whatever it was to slowly change someone's opinions on an individually targeted level. That's an evil breach point. How's that surface area problem? Now, I've heard discussions 
uh, like this um, many times in the last uh, you know three four five years um, in tiny little stovepipes within the U.S. government in the J39, the SMA group, uh, several other places in the IC, but not really. And I would just uh, um, opine that uh, this very discussion needs to be happening far more uh, in a, uh, a less politicized way on Capitol Hill and among policymakers and IC leaders um, and, and Department of Defense leaders. All right, so let me uh, get a little bit more practical here, uh, give you an opportunity to um, talk about the work that you've been doing with your companies because I find it to be uh, path-breaking. We were talking about the roadmap. You're building the roadmaps. It's interesting that neither of you actually decided in your projection of the next five years to talk about things that you're uh, rolling out and deploying right this second. Uh, which leads me to suspect that you have secret R&D projects that are working on other things, which is fantastic. Bob told me I couldn't sell my software on stage. That's, uh... <laughs> <laughs> no, but let, let's talk about the technological approach. Uh, because, look, I was, fat, as everybody, fascinated by having Vent Surf here. It's always phenomenal to hear Vent Surf. Uh, I hope there is some, you know, cryogenic project already underway for Vent Surf. Yes. And the way he leapt off that stage, we're not going to need it. Or maybe it's already succeeded. I don't know. <laughs> Um, a spin out of uh, Google's X project is the, the VentSurf 2.0 that we just saw this morning. Um, but, uh, you know, Lick Lighter, that 1960 paper that uh, Bob Gorley, I think, sent me a long time ago, uh, Man Computer Symbiosis. Uh, uh, Mike, your company is working on non parametric instance based learning uh, whose performance and capability exceeds neural networks. Somehow I got a kind of lick lighter sense out of that. Um, explain the exceeds neural networks approach because we're all, uh, one of our, uh, during the uh, cookie break, um, one, one of our other uh, uh, participants here uh, mentioned to me, ask the panelists, isn't uh, reinforcement learning just, isn't current AI just one long series of if statements holding hands? which is a very uh, pithy way of uh, thinking about the current approach. Sounds like you're trying something different. Gosh, I hope our website doesn't say we're better generically than neural networks. Um, at Diveplane, we, we build explainable AI, human understandable, transparent, auditable. Anytime you have AI making a decision that's safety critical or mission critical or big, big dollar figure, it's nice to have it explain the rationale. Uh, and we think it's really important to do that, that you always keep the data around. So there's no transformation phase where first you have a whole bunch of stuff and then you compress it through the pachinko machine of neural nets and now you have a bunch of transformations that you don't really understand what they are and no one can explain it because there's more nodes there than there are cells in the human brain. Um, that approach doesn't lend itself well to explanation. There's a lot of sort of attempts to explain, but they don't work. Uh, I would say the high level though, um, and by the way, we come out of uh, Stratcom, IC, and the like, anybody who was building simulations that needed to know why, uh, and then we're commercializing that tech. Um, but the thing I love about it is that we're able to, to pull the knowledge out of a data set and build a real knowledge representation. It's a physics thing. It's an information theory uh, 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 approach as opposed to sort of this practical biological hack called neural networks, um, which lets us learn from it. Uh, because I don't have any reason why I, uh, my wife and I get along. I have some theories, but I'm wrong, um, most most definitely. Uh, and I have the genetic code for my daughter, but I can't tell you what she's going to eat for dinner, which is about the same as having an open source neural net. Like you, you might see the code, but you have no idea what the heck it's doing or why. But if you can have the red team beat you and then say, here's how I beat you, Daniel son, and walk you through the decisions it made, then everybody gets better at it. And then that's what's going to make the next AI better. Like I hope stable diffusion is this example we keep tapping is going to generate art that inspires artists to make cool new types of original art that then makes a cooler new stable diffusion in the future. And art gets better and evolves in a way that it has been obviously doing since the dawn of mankind, but in a slow way. So putting the human and the AI in the same loop and continuing to improve is what really excites me. And it has practical applications, like I was saying, like, okay, if I'm gonna buy that building, why should I do that again before I risk my job? Or why should I take the shot? Let me understand. 
Um, that's all super handy, but I love this closing the loop of human knowledge and AI together. Sean, as I was um, uh, talking with some DoD friends who are already customers of, of yours and uh, combing through um, not just your website, but some of the papers that your people have uh, authored, um, I, I got reminded of somebody we uh, had a mention of several times this morning, Elon Musk. We had Elon Musk at an AFCEA thing uh, back in 2015, and um, I asked him, uh, what's, uh, um, I'm a huge believer in DARPA and R&D budgets. I know how much the DARPA R&D budget is. I know how much, you know, Don reminded us what the government investment levels are. I said, what's... Uh, what percentages of uh, your annual, uh, uh, annual revenue uh, do you put into R&D to take the R&D tax credit uh, was the parenthetical uh, thought behind it. He said, oh, we don't do any. Everything is R&D. 100% of it is R&D. I don't claim it as tax credit. I don't think of it that way. We don't even think about it. I don't have a chief R&D officer. I'm the chief R&D officer. He went on a long explanation of how uh, it's 2015, how every SpaceX launch was essentially an R&D data gathering effort. And you notice, if you, think, if you watch like I do as a fan of the uh, accuracy and predictability of those uh, re-entry landings and just how dead on they are when we used to just be rooting for it to get anywhere near the drone ship. Um, and every Tesla, all these Teslas people have been bragging about all day, uh, data gathering uh, research vehicles, right? Improving the next uh, generation of, of FSD. But uh, I started to think about Primer somewhat in that way. And how do, you, as the CEO, how do you think about this? As the founder, what what's your thinking about? You've got this company, you've got a, a bunch of other interests and thoughts about the horizon of AI. How do you think about the company and its role in this? Yeah, I mean, look, I think the first thing to sort of acknowledge is that we're in an AI arms race against China. And so, you know, it's it's a red queen, you know, running you know, faster and faster just to keep up the speed that these things are evolving at surprises me and I'm, I'm right in the middle of it. So, you know, everything you're doing has to be R&D because everything that you were doing is now irrelevant. And so when you're in an AI arms race, as we are with China, you, you need to be faster than your opponent. Um, and so I think as we go through this, um, you know, there's, there's one piece is, is the, is the R and D and the second is the operation operationalization of it. And, you know, I think as we look at, um, the dynamics, if we want to win this race, I think we need to bring those two together. And, and where I spend a lot of my time as CEO is, is operationalizing or trying to operationalize, um, the research um, and get into the hands of the warfighters um, and the intelligence analysts and the people on the front line so they can make use of it because the speed at which this is moving, you could be, have the best AI in the world, but if it takes you six months to get into the hands of the soldier, um, somebody who um, is behind you in terms of AI capabilities but gets into the hands of the soldier in six weeks is going to be ahead of you. So this has never been the case of building an F-35. That just wasn't the case, you know, but an AI you know, six months is a lifetime and six months um, is, is really the delta of, of how long it can take a fast deployment or a slow deployment. So everything here, I think, is, is about how fast can we move this stuff from, from the hands of um, research scientists, the hands of soldiers. And to go back to, to the example of stability, I'm an advisor to that company and been an advisor there for a while now. But that stuff was published, Stable Diffusion was published as, a, as an ar archive preprint six months ago. It is now in um, numerous um, commercial software applications that are generating money today, perhaps um, you know, on, on order of, of hundreds of millions of dollars. That's, that, that is unheard of, to go from a, a preprint to a commercial application of six months. It used to be 10 years, right? And so in AI, you've got a compression of at least 20x of the time from, there's not even a peer reviewed scientific paper, it's a preprint to a commercial product in six months. And we have to internalize what that means for conflict and for war, but it means that speed is more important than anything else. How fast can you get it in the hands? And the procurement cycles are killing us. We can be the best AI nation in the world, and I believe we are, but we can lose an AI war 
because it takes us longer than the opponent to get into the hands. And that is where, you know, for all of, you know, Jack, Jack Clark's kind of like um, statements, it's, it's compute and data. No, it's deployment. It is deployment, deployment, deployment. And we miss that at our peril. I'll also add that there's been, what, three companies that have crossed this, that divide successfully to procurement, and they were all founded by billionaires. It's Mr. SpaceX, who didn't take the tax credit because he didn't have time. Do you guys take an R&D tax credit? Of course you do. Anyone smart does. Uh, must be nice to be able to skip that part. Oh, and Palmer Lucky from Anduril, billionaire from Oculus, Blue Origin. The, I think that's changed. Like, we're going to see that change. It's that got to. It is, and look, we're not a company, as much as I'd like to be a company founded by a billionaire, um, you know, mate, we're not. Um, and the private capital markets are providing um, the kinds of money to compete on the long cycle of defense acquisition, and that money is coming in, and um, there's going to be a number of companies that are going to be, um, I think, funded by the private equity markets um, on, on a time frame that allows for, and at a scale that allows for, um, I think, strong competition in defense. So that, that narrative of you can only do this if you're a billionaire is what it used to be. Um, that, that won't be the case. Um, and, you know, I think, I think there's going to be a lot of um, defense companies coming in and, and participating. Well, we've only got about a half hour left. Oh, wait, I see. <laughs> Sadly, we don't just have fainted. Did left. you see that? Yeah. yeah. Well, this has been fascinating. Please thank our two wonderful panelists for Thanks.